and I want to get my effort from the beginning. First of all, I want to thank the uh, staff and the faculty here at the school. Honestly, without you guys, I wouldn't be where I am today. They live in Phoenix, so they are watching through the magic of the interwebs back there. Um, thank you, Mom. Everybody wave to my mom on the camera. Um, I want to thank my wife's family, the sign of the, the most gracious, loving people that I've ever met. And they have seriously blessed me in so many ways that I can. And finally, of course, I want to thank my incredible wife. Um, my biggest dream when I came here was that I'd be able to say hi. I'm going to pray, and then uh, the worship band is going to let us God, thank you for today. Thank you so much for everything you're doing in our lives. I pray that you would just be here today, uh, just invade this place, and let us be focused on you above everything else, God. We love you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. My privilege to introduce to you today Mr. Elliot Voris. I, yeah, that's exciting. I have had the privilege for the last couple of years of working with Elliot over at First Christian, and he has proven himself in every way to be very talented and uh, very reliable. One of the things that I appreciate most about Elliot is Though he can do just about anything you ask him to do, he's not a self-promoter. He just uh, faithfully goes about his business, uh, and I've grown to respect that a lot about him. However, the conclusions that I've drawn about Elliot are not necessarily congruous with my first impressions of Elliot a couple of years ago. We met at a week of church camp that... Um, that I was the dean of, and he came on staff, and it struck me at first that Elliot was the kind of guy who, he just seemed kind of young and immature. I, um, I saw him for the first time, and I remember uh, back then I didn't know what gauges even were, and I, I thought that he had two gigantic moles on either earlobe. And it, uh, after talking to him, I realized he was doing that to his skin on purpose. The other thing that I noticed right away with Elliot that was troubling to me is that he seems to have this ongoing, uh, irresistible urge to hug people inappropriately. <laughs> and um, kind of caught me off guard uh, at first. And even though he and I have talked about that, uh, he continues to do all manners of stroking and patting and grabbing when we meet each other for the first time. It's just really, are any of you with me? I mean, you've hugged, how many of you have hugged Elliot? Yeah, see, I'm not alone in this. Don't judge me. He, um, if you've never hugged Elliot, uh, congratulations. Um, but if you have, it's, uh, he doesn't settle for the man hug. You know, there's no, there's no hand clasp, forearm separating the torso, two pat thing. He doesn't settle for that. Uh, it's like, uh, he always like grabs my spine and like, squ it hurts. You know, it's not, it's just weird. We've, we've talked it over, but he's, he's not listening because he keeps, he keeps doing it. But, you know, the thing is, Elliot loves people, and um, though it may manifest itself in rather odd ways from time to time, uh, he really does love people. And if you know Elliot very well, been around him very long, you know that people uh, love him back. He also kind of stands alone, I think, in this year's senior class, and I'm not sure I'm correct, so what I'd like to do is conduct a quick poll. Uh, how many of uh, how, how many of you that are sitting in here um, today have the great Shema tattooed on your forearm? Raise your hand. Yeah, o only one. Um, how many of you are prolific hardcore dancers? And if you don't know what that is, then you you aren't. Yeah, okay, only one. How many of you can? Uh, can fix your internet connection at any time of night. 
Yeah, a couple of you. But how many of you can do all three of those at the same time? Yeah, just Elliot. So he really, he really stands out in that way. Congratulations to you, Elliot. There's one more thing that I just feel compelled to say about Elliot, and this is perhaps the most important of all, but I just think that this is the day where we remember that Elliot had a Justin Bieber haircut before Justin Bieber was cool. And this is a bold prediction, but I suspect that Elliot will be cooler long after Justin Bieber fades into the sunset. So, Elliot, while I secretly hope you never hug me again, we're excited for you today for you to come up and share in your senior chapel. Give it up for Elliot, everybody. Thanks, Titus. Actually, the plugs do affect my hearing, so I can't hear when he tells me not to hug him. Um, I want to tell you guys a story. Like every good story, it starts with a party. We'll be starting... No? <laughs> we'll be starting in Mark chapter 11, if you want to follow along. Open up there, and we'll move forward from there. Jesus is coming into town. It's almost time for the Passover, and Jerusalem is packed with excitement. It's crazy. And people come out to see Jesus in crowds. They are so excited to see him. They start shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest! Which means, literally, God, save us. They knew that Jesus was there to save them. And they were proclaiming his Messiahship. They knew he was the Messiah, but here's the deal. They had a different expectation for the Messiah than Jesus was here to fulfill. They had been under Roman oppression for a long, long, long time. And so they, their idea of the Messiah was someone who would rise up, get rid of Rome, and let Israel live a peaceful existence. But that's not what Jesus had in mind. He came to save us from our spiritual oppression. And so, these people, as Jesus approaches this town called Bethany, it's a small town, kind of like Florissant is to St. Louis, approaches Bethany, people are excited to see him. He's, ride, he's riding on this donkey that no one's ever ridden before. Pretty sweet. People start laying palm branches, coats, other things down, so that this donkey doesn't have to touch the ground, like it's undignified or something. Jesus is coming into town, and he stops in Bethany for the night. Because Jerusalem gets crazy during Passover. If you're not from St. Louis, you might not know, but St. Louis is one of the biggest party t towns during Mardi Gras. Give it up for St. Louis, right? <laughs> so if you're coming into town, like a lot of people do from all over the country, for Mardi Gras, it might be a little bit tough to find a hotel room in St. Louis City. So you might come to, say, Florissant, somewhere it's a little easier, a little cheaper to get a hotel room. So Jesus... Stops in Florida, Bethany, <laughs> because Jerusalem is crazy during the Passover. So he stops in Bethany for the night, unpacks his stuff, and later that day, heads to Jerusalem. And he gets there, and there's nobody really around. It's late at night. And the Bible doesn't say this, but I think he was praying. He knew that this Passover was going to directly precede his crucifixion, some intense conversations, intense confrontation. Jesus, I think, was praying because he knew what lays ahead. Lies ahead? Whichever. He's walking around the town. Nobody's there, so he heads back to Bethany because Jerusalem is crazy during Mardi Gras. Or Passover, if you're keeping track. Next day, he heads back to Jerusalem. On the way, he gets a little hungry. Stops at a fig tree. Figs were evidently popular back then. Trying to get a little fruit, but the fig tree has no fruit on it. And so, like you or I would do, he curses the fig tree says, may no one ever eat from your fruit again. A little harsh, Jesus. Just a tree. So he curses the fig tree, moves on, so will we. Gets to Jerusalem, and he is sickened by what he sees. This is the second time he's come into the temple and is not happy with what he sees. There are people changing money, selling cattle, selling doves in the temple courts. And a lot of people take this to say, we can't sell anything in church. Not quite true. The issue was this religious institution that had become so entrenched. If you're a Jewish family, you come to Jerusalem at least one time a year. You have to make a sacrifice during the Passover. It's just ob obligated. That's the word. You have to make this sacrifice. And so when you come, you bring your precious little lamb, your perfect lamb, the only one you have. 
and you say to the priest, this is my sacrifice. The priest says, sorry, man, one's not good enough. But I tell you what we can do. We'll take this one. We'll sell you this other one. It's like a used car salesman. We'll sell you this other one, and then you can sacrifice that. So you shell out some dough because you have to make this sacrifice. You can't afford not to. So you shell out some dough, and they say, whoa, whoa, whoa. We don't take that kind of money. You got silver coins. We only take gold. But if you go over to that table, they can hook you up. So you go over to this table. You change out your money. You pay a ridiculous overhead, and you get your money changed. You go back to this table, say, okay, I got my gold coins, whatever you need. Here you go. And you're paying way more than what this lamb is worth because just like Christmas time, Barbies are way more expensive because everybody wants them. This sheep is an expensive thing when really the sheep that you brought, there was nothing wrong with it in the first place. And so these religious leaders, these priests, were standing in the way of these worshipers. They were there to heartfeltly worship the Lord. They were there to serve Him, to obey the commands. And these religious leaders were messing it up. So Jesus sees this happening. And this is the second time He's seen it, the second time He's done something about it. About two years ago He did this. He kicks all the money changers out, doesn't allow anyone to sell or buy anything in the temple courts. It's an intense day. I wish I could have been there. I'd be needing a new pair of underwear. Goes back to Bethany. Stays the night. Next morning, wakes up, heading back to Jerusalem. But in the middle, his disciples see this fig tree. This fig tree that Jesus had cursed the day before is completely dead, withered from the roots. If you know anything about farming, that doesn't happen overnight. Jesus curses this fig tree to make a very important point, which we'll see play out in a minute. Anything that doesn't bear fruit is as good as dead. The apostles notice this. Jesus cursed this tree. It's dead now. And we move back to Jerusalem. Understandably, religious leaders are a little bit angry, to say the least. They basically say, Jesus, what gives you the right to come up and mess up our stuff? We had a good thing going here. We were making some money. You know, and then you come in, throw everybody out. Not cool, Jesus. And he says, I'll answer your question with another question. It's a very Jesus thing to do. He says, John's resurrection, was it from God or was it from men? And I I imagine the Pharisees and the Sadducees getting into a little huddle. They say, what do you think, guys? From God? From man? What do you think? Whispering behind behind their backs. And they come up to Jesus with a very churchy answer, say, we don't know. They were scared. If they said it was from God, then Jesus would be on their case, saying, why didn't you believe him? Why didn't you follow him if you knew it was from God? But if they said from man, then all the people who had a very high regard for John would have revolted against the religious leaders. So they were in a lose-lose situation in their minds. So they said, we don't know. And Jesus basically says, if your heart isn't in the right place, if you don't really want to know the answer to your question you're asking me about my authority, I'm not even going to waste my time. He says, It's not worth it. Move on. We'll do something else. And so Jesus tells a story. So here we are. In a story inside of a story. There was a landowner. Turns his land into a vineyard. Digs a a trench for the wall. Digs a wine press. Plows the fields. He does everything that a vineyard owner needs to do. If you and I were in the vineyard business, we would say, that's a good looking vineyard. But we're not, so we've got to take Jesus at his word. He rents it out, just like a tenant in an apartment complex. He rents it out to these people who are going to work the land, pay him a little bit of rent. So he goes on a trip. Some time goes by. He sends a messenger to get a little bit of the money, a little bit of the fruit that these people have grown on his land. And they say, no, we don't want to pay. They beat up the messenger, send him away empty-handed. Landowner says, okay, send another messenger. Send a second messenger. Beat him up, send him away empty-handed. Sends a third messenger. They kill him. And again and again and again, a messenger is sent, and a messenger is sent, and they beat him up, or they kill him, and they don't pay their rent. Jesus says, any normal person would get rid of the tenants, fill it with people who will pay them rent. And finally, the landowner sends his son, 
He says, if they're going to listen to anyone, it's going to be my son. And the, the tenants think to themselves, if we kill this son, then we can have the inheritance. We can earn the right to all the money that this guy's got. So they kill the son, and naturally he isn't too proud, too happy about that. And so Jesus tells this story specifically to the religious leaders because they are the tenants. And for all of history, God has been sending his prophets, his messengers, to get them to pay rent to God. And now Jesus, God's own son, his one-of-a-kind son, is there in the flesh, and they're about to kill him. And so in order to shut him up, the religious leaders begin planning. How can we kill this guy? How can we kill this guy? And they come up with this awesome plan, which I thought of it. They're going to ask him some trick questions. Sounds cool. They send three representatives, which is, it gets ironic here in a minute. They send three representatives. First, a Pharisee. They ask, Jesus, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Ironic, because the Pharisees would have hands down answered, no, we shouldn't. We hate Rome. We hate everything about it. We shouldn't pay them a dime. So Jesus says, give me a quarter. Whose picture is that? I don't know who's on the quarter, but on their money, it was Caesar. He says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. This money is just part of the empire. Don't keep it for yourself. Give to Caesar what is his. Pharisees walk away. They're amazed with his answer. They say, dang it. Couldn't trick him. Send a Sadducee, number two. Sadducees, the Sadducees were sad, you see, because they didn't believe <laughs> in a physical resurrection. Ironically, they ask a question about the resurrection. They, send, they say, at the end of all time, when things go down, when God comes back, will there be marriage at the resurrection? Jesus basically says, you don't even believe in a resurrection. What are you doing asking me about that? But he answers their question just to appease them. He says, no, you will neither give nor be, be given in marriage at the final day. Dang it. Can't catch him on that one either. Finally, they send a scribe. And the scribes were the experts in the law. They knew the law, the Old Testament, backwards, forwards, like the back of their hand. They knew what was in the Old Testament. And he asked, what is the greatest commandment? Out of all the pizza toppings, if you could pick one to eat for the rest of your life, which would you pick? What? Different. Out of all the commandments, which one is the most important? And Jesus says this. It's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. I like that one. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. All the law and the prophets hinge on these two laws, these two commandments. And Jesus points out that everything in the Old Testament boils down to these two commandments. Love God with everything you have and love other people more than you love yourself. It's so simple. It's so beautiful. And it's echoed again and again and again in the New Testament, in the teachings of Jesus, in the life of the apostles, in the writings of Paul. We see these concepts come up again and again and again and again. It's so simple. Everything that we are living for breaks down to these two things. Love God, love other people. And the religious leaders were too blind to see this. They were too blind. They didn't have their hearts in the right place. And like Jesus had pointed out earlier, whatever doesn't bear fruit is as good as dead. But we mess this up all the time. We put other things in front of loving God. We put other things in front of loving other people. And when we let something get in the way of obeying the commandments of the Lord, that is idolatry. It's not a pretty word, but that's what it is. Let's call it that. It's idolatry when we let something get in between us and God. Jesus has a very simple way of getting rid of sin. In Matthew chapter 5, he says, If your right hand makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. 
For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Jesus says, I know that things are going to come up that trip you down, trip you up. When that happens, get rid of it. Do whatever it takes to get rid of it. This is mine. I love computers. I love everything about them. I went through all the trouble of setting up a live stream because that is fun to me. (laughs) But if I'm not careful, this will take the place of God. This will take the place of my wife. This will take the place of my friends. And Jesus says, if there is something that gets in your way, get rid of it. Do whatever it takes. He's not joking around when he says, cut off your right hand. Do whatever it takes. If there's something that gets in your way, do whatever it takes. The good news is, we're not alone. God promises that he is going to be with us. And he is going to help us Get rid of the things that trip us up. In Ezekiel, God writes, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers. So you will be my people and I will be your God. Moreover, I will save you from all your uncleanness. And I will call for the grain and multiply it. And I will not bring famine on you. We're not alone, guys. And through all of this, there is nothing, absolutely nothing... No fear, no hesitation, no insecurity, no struggle of ours, no doubt, no idol that will ever separate us from the love of God. Because because we are the sons of the living God. Because we are the children of the Almighty. Because we are the residents of the kingdom of heaven. And we are soldiers in an army of of the immortal. And when we speak life, life happens. When we speak healing, Healing happens when we speak truth. Truth happens. And when we go and take what we have found to a dead world, we'll see it come to life again. When we take what we have found to a hopeless world, we'll see hope come back. We'll see the heart of our world start beating again. We'll see the color come back to people's faces. And nothing will ever stop that. And mountains will move before us, and oceans will part before us, and the dead will raise before us. And the world will know that our God is a God that heals, that our God is a God that lives, that our God is a God that loves unlike anything anyone has ever felt before. Because we are fearless, because we are His hands, because we are His feet forever and ever.